Welcome to Pipeline Conversations, a machine learning podcast by ZenML. This week, I spoke with Tristan Zients, the CEO and co-founder of Continual, a company that provides an AI layer for enterprise companies or, as we'll get into in the podcast, the so-called modern data stack. He previously worked at Cloudera as a CTO for machine learning and as the head of the data science platform there, and he holds a PhD in public policy from Harvard University. In our conversation, we discussed the different levels of abstraction one can take when dealing with the MLOps problem. We spoke about all the different ways that machine learning can fail in production settings. And of course, we got into the concept of the modern data stack and exactly what that means. I asked Tristan to begin by introducing himself and the work he's busy with at Continual. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan of uh, ZenML, and I've been watching what you've been building over there for a while. Um, and you know, generally, I'm a fan of any tool that sort of tries to raise the abstraction level uh, for uh, solving these ML problems, because uh, it just seems like there's far too much complexity in this area. But yeah, so who, who am I? So my name is Tristan. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Continual. Uh, we're a startup building what we call a data-first uh, platform for operational AI. It's really about it sits on top of your data warehouse makes it easy easy for anybody to build predictive models that sort of never stop learning from their data. Um, uh, and I can chat much more about sort of what brought us to that. Um, I've been building uh, sort of ML tooling uh, and been in the ML infrastructure space for the last 10 years or so. Uh, in the 2000s or sort of 13, uh, 14 era, I came out of grad school sort of as a, as a statistician, uh, really wanted to get into the world of startups, uh, having done a little bit of that in the past. Um, and, and felt like there was a really a need for uh, uh, tools to enable data scientists, uh, you know, particularly open source uh, data scientists using open source tools, uh, wanting to leverage the compute capabilities of the cloud. And so I started a company called Sense, which was really one of the first generation data science platforms uh, where we were trying to pioneer that as a category. Um, and, uh, you know, so we went through the whole, you know, struggles of what that means. What is an enterprise data science platform? Is it notebooks? Is it more than notebooks? Is it pipelines? Um, are we trying to enable collaboration? Are we trying to enable production? Um, uh, you know, in 2016, that company got acquired by uh, Cloudera, which is the leading provider of Hadoop. So the big data, you know, open source, big data platform um, uh, uh, called Hadoop, which is a, a whole ecosystem of tools. Um, the product there, the Sense product became Cloudera's machine learning product. Uh, they recognized, I think rightfully so, that machine learning was a critical emerging use case uh, on any data platform. Um, and I think that's increasingly true today, where one of the dominant workloads and certainly one of the most exciting workloads for all the data that companies are collecting is uh, machine learning, AI, predictive analytics, whatever you want to uh, call it. So was at Cloudera for three years, leading their machine learning platform efforts, um, you know, talked to some of the biggest companies in the world who were trying to, you know, uh, sort of unlock the value of their data, um, which was a really eye-opening experience. Um, had a great time there, lots of incredibly smart people, um, you know, also saw the tr tremendous shifts that were going on as companies were moving towards the cloud, trying to simplify their data architectures. Uh, the rise of cloud data warehouses. And that really led me uh, into what we're doing now at Continual. Um, where we're, you know, trying to solve some of the problems that I saw, you know, while I was talking with customers at Cloudera um, and building sort of what I would call like first generation machine learning uh, infrastructure. Uh, and you know, now continue where we're trying to say, hey, can we can we radically improve this in certain ways? And we have and we have certain beliefs around it. I was browsing through some of the videos and, and talks and stuff you've given in the past, and I came across the demo of Sense that you did on YouTube somewhere. And even now, it still feels like a nice set of things for a data scientist. Yeah, it, it, it still feels no, fresh, I, even though it's at the beginning of what you were doing. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, ama it's amazing to see. I mean, it, it, it's amazing to see all the new companies uh, that are doing many of the similar things that we did right in 2000. That video is probably from 2013. And mm -hmm. there are some really, there are really some really fun parts to that, to that, to that video. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think there's some, I think there, there, uh, we've learned a lot and there's some amazing new tools. Um, you know, I think we, we started with some, you know, core notebook functionality, trying to enable data scientists to collaborate. You know, now you have these best of breed tools like Hex and DeepNote uh, that are really just taking that way farther, way deeper, just saying, let's just absolutely build the best collaboration experience for exploratory data science. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and likewise, I think when you think about, you know, you know, that was sort of the notebook and collaboration uh, feature was one of the main things we were solving at Sense. 
you know, we then realized very quickly, you know, that's all great, but, you know, ultimately, you know, you want to schedule these things and start to have pipelines. And then of course, now you have a whole, you know, pipeline ecosystem, right? So next generation companies that are sort of trying to build next generation pipelines, either broadly, things like Prefect and Dagster, or specific to ML, things like ZenML, uh, that are trying to think about how to, how to build these pipelines. Um, so, so yeah, you know, de model deployment, we know that was another thing we were, we were really, you know, what, what is the workflow of going from research to production and model deployment? We were one of the first art, first platforms that was really embracing containerization, Docker, isolation, you know, really allowing data scientists to have all the flexibility that they want, uh, while also trying to make it easy for them to move from research to production. Uh, and I think that was a, you know, that, that was a, a big theme of the work that we were doing at Sense and the work that we were doing at Cloudera. I've actually come to a little bit of a, an agreement that we potentially should keep these worlds a little bit separate, um, where, you know, we should have, uh, you know, tools that are really, really focused on, you know, exploration and sort of development. Uh, but then uh, production tools, uh, there may be enough meat on the bones there to really have a, a platform and a set of tools that are just really focused on the production workflow. Um, you know, of course, you need a you need a you need a way to be able to move between them, but they don't all necessarily need to be in the same platform. That's really interesting, actually. Has that come out of experiences with people that you are who are using your services or your own personal experience? This this separation. Well, one thing that I definitely learned was that it's incredibly hard if you start from sort of enabling collaboration and exploration and as a product builder. If you're building a product that puts that front and center and it's just ease of use and collaboration and, uh, and sort of a notebook and you know, plots and things like that, it's very hard then to move that, to, to expand that platform into a true production platform. It's not hard to, you know, to, to demo Hey, you know, you can, you know, all these platforms out there here, you can, you know, wrap a model and make it a REST endpoint in one click, right? But, uh, you know, in a container, but that's not really the hard challenge of production and operational ML. Um, so when you start to think about separation between your different environments, right? When you start to think about the end to end uh, pipeline and the end to end, you know, monitoring that you need of that, uh, there's enough stuff there. Uh, where, you know, sticking a little notebook, you know, if you start from a notebook and a collaboration notebook, it's very hard for you to get uh, to what I would say would be like a, an ML ops platform, where I'm defining ML ops as really the full life cycle of machine learning operations. I really don't, I also do not think that, you know, machine learning operations platforms that just, you know, put models in containers or just monitor you know, models, that really is not a machine learning operations platform in my view. I think you really need to think about the end-to-end -end life cycle, the maintenance of models, the data that's flowing in for training and for inference, uh, the training process, the, the prediction process, batch in real time, and, you know, of course, monitoring. And then a work a workflow, uh, you know, to both run those pipelines, but also for the developer to iterate, you know, on those pipelines and then move them to production. Uh, and that's a, you know, that's kind of an that's a, that's a big, big ask. So, you know, if you, you know, it's unlikely that, you know, that will come out of a, a platform that's, you know, basically starts with, you know, notebooks and, and collaboration. It's, it has been my... Obviously, you're in this tooling space and there's just an incredible amount of, I don't know, thrashing, I guess, would be the word that comes to, 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 to mind. There's a lot of people going in lots of different directions. It's not entirely clear to me that there's been like convergence on kind of a, an overall direction for all of these or, or a, yeah, a, an overall direction for all of these different tools. Do you have a sense of, and that's kind of why I brought up that earlier video, do you feel like we're moving forward in a kind of uh, towards some progress or do you think we're still searching for the, the kind of the base paradigms that will, you know, 10 years from now, we'll look back and we'll think, what were we doing? I think we're candidly, I think we're still uh, searching for the base paradigms. I mean, I think there's some great tools out there for parts of the life cycle, right? There are absolutely fantastic notebook tools out there now for that for that crowd. Uh, you know, some of the experiment trackers, you know, now things like weights and biases, they're just like, they're a pleasure to use. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's some interesting, you know, some of the monitoring tools, like the fiddlers of the world, uh, there's some really, you know, nice monitoring tools for, for monitoring and explainability. So in that sense, I think some of the individual components of, uh, of the stack have, uh, you know, uh, have matured. Um, but I still think it's just, uh, I, I think there's the foundational, there's a lot of chaos in terms of the end to end uh, workflows. Um, I honestly have never talked to any company that really is happy with what they're doing. I mean, that's the candid answer. Uh, and so, no, I don't, I don't think we're, 
you know, I don't think we've really converged yet on the, the right approach to ML. I, I think, you know, to, I mean, to dive a little bit deeper, where, where do I think things are going to go? I think things at the very foundational level, I think there should be and will be a convergence around, you know, what does an ML pipeline uh, look like? What does a pipeline around training and inference and monitoring look like? And that, you know, TFX kind of hints maybe at that. Uh, so what Google did with TFX hints at the kind of the canonical steps of an ML, ML pipeline. So I think there needs to be and should be an attention to what are those canonical steps and standardizing around the inputs and the outputs for those steps so that, that you can then build the higher level experiences on top of that. So I do think that is something that will happen and that will move from complete pipeline jungle world to a more structured set of pipelines, even for ML engineering. So for the, I'm talking here for the ML engineer. I think really our view at Continual is that's probably the right approach for the sophisticated ML engineer who really needs complete control over everything but that there really needs to be another step, which I would call data first approaches to ML. So if I look at that pipeline, I think once you start to look at ML pipelines and you start to think about the inputs and outputs of them, you realize they are quite standardized. And then the question becomes, well, what is unique to the problem at hand? You know, everything, the ML algorithms or the trend there in research is, you know, overwhelmingly towards sort of convergence, you know, algorithms that can handle many different types with standard architectures. Even if you're using multiple model, you know, types, I mean, honestly, auto ML approaches are getting better and better, particularly when you have complex data with multimodal features. If you're getting down, you don't need to get down into the weeds of that. I think automated approaches to the, the models themselves, pre-training, all of that is going to cause you know, that to become fewer and fewer people to want to go all the way down into that level. And then once you start to realize that there is a standardized pipeline at a higher level, you'll also say, well, that's also just a standardized you know, training, monitoring, profiling, testing, performance you know, comparisons, tuning. All of those steps are you know, pretty much common. And so what you're left with is, okay, what's your data? What are you trying to predict? Namely, what are the outputs of your machine learning models? And what are the inputs, uh, what are the features and the signals that you can bring to bear on those models? And so I think that we're very early on this, but ultimately there really is going to be a next generation of products that starts with the idea that your workflow should be centered on your data and, and tries to at least aspirationally automate the rest. Maybe there's escape patches where you can go below the hatch and change things if you want, but aspirationally, why can't I just model and organize my data and then you know what I'm trying to predict and have everything flow from that? And of course, flow from it in a way that's actually in production, not just kind of, well, I get some good results and I show some slides or I get a good UI that actually is maintained, monitored and governed, uh, you know, in production. Mm -hmm. Before we, we, we talk too much about the, the kind of the, the end point or the solution or the place we're going forward, just go back to the kind of the, the problems, I guess, of like why you, why we are, are kind of all working in this space. Because I know you have a, like a, a decent amount of experience working in deployed settings with ML in production. It's kind of a big question, but what are the things that you've seen commonly go wrong or what are the key pain points which which in general people are having? And you can take that uh, as, as you wish. That's a great question. So, I mean, I think overarching uh, the problem that I have seen is complexity. Um, I think Nick Schrock, who's the, the founder of uh, Dagster, has this nice quote where he says, we've moved from an era of big data to an era of big complexity. And, you know, I really think that that's, uh, that, that's true. And what I mean by that is, at least from my experience, there's sort of like three elements to the complexity. Um, so the first is the infrastructure complexity. If you look at AI infrastructure today, uh, production AI infrastructure, when you're really thinking about end-to-end -end, uh, production ML pipelines and, you know, in serving infrastructure, uh, it's extremely complicated, right? So you have, you know, typically you have six or seven uh, different distributed systems uh, inside a canonical stack diagram that you might see from a Spotify, an Uber, uh, you know, a DoorDash, um, right? If you look at those, uh, you know, those posts where people describe their, you know, ML engineering infrastructure for production, and you actually stare at each one of those boxes, uh, you realize, wow, this is seven different distributed systems. Uh, and then there is some kind of AI orchestration thing that's going on that's bouncing between them, right? And that gets, to, you know, that's from your historical data storage, right? Your feature store, which includes historical data storage, real-time data storage, feature transformation, streaming. I mean, often even just the feature store element of it is, you know, a, a data lake, a real-time cache, a stream processor, a batch processor with Spark, distributed batch processor. So it's like, even just to get the data into the shape that you, that you need for training and for inference, uh, for serving, 
it's like, wow, you could even have three or four distributed systems right there. And then the ML engineer needs to not, or well, the infra, the platform team needs to maintain that. The ML engineer needs to, and data engineer needs to think about how to, you know, use it, how to write Spark jobs, how to write Flink streaming jobs, how to, you know, so just there, just on the feature store aspect, you know, there's tremendous complexity. Uh, you know, and then you, you know, you take it to the training infrastructure and you're, and you're, you're now you're dealing, you know, with, with Kubernetes and, you know, you know, uh, all the containerization and dependency management. And then of course, GPUs enter the picture. And then, you know, God forbid you have to do distributed training and distributed training enters the picture. Uh, and then of course they're inside there, there's, you know, you have to be an ML expert to actually build these models from scratch. So if you look at, you're building these models, if you're building these models yourself, you know, there's a lot of complexity there and that's training. And then you want to move it to, to, you know, the inference layer and you need to think about how to do that. And now you're dealing with API gateways and you're dealing with monitoring solutions and you're layering on monitoring solutions. Uh, you know, and then of course you're trying to tie this, you know, all this together. And so there's just tremendous, you know, infrastructure complexity there uh, to implement, uh, you know, a single use case. That's one area. The, the second area is, um, is really, you know, sort of the team challenges around the team. Uh, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, there's many, many, many more very talented data professionals than they are people that know, you know, everything down from like cloud infrastructure to Kubernetes to data science uh, to, you know, uh, to like, you know, the full business stack. impact, the full stack. Full stack. Um, yeah. And so it's it's a real challenge if you, if, uh, so even if you find these people, right, who know all of this or you train them, they're just so time constrained, right? And so what happens is, you know, and this was my experience at Cloudera, you, you often talk to a company and they, they have a thousand ideas, they'll show a slide of, you know, we wanna be AI driven, you know, here's all of the ideas that we want. And, you know, it just, you realize there's just no way you can actually implement all of those ideas and, and maybe even justify the ROI, or you just simply do not have the time. So even, you know, often you do not have an actual skill, so you do not have the skill set. But I mean, in many cases, there are very talented people in these companies, but everybody's just, you know, it's incredibly time, const time constrained. Um, so there's team challenges. I think you've got to broaden and democratize uh, ML and also just make it much, much more productive. And then I think finally, an underappreciated set of challenges, although I kind of hinted it at the infrastructure, is just around operations. Um, I don't think, you know, people, the complexity around the model maintenance process, uh, people don't realize uh, always that once, if, if your model's actually in production, everything needs to be maintained and monitored. And so often you prototype it, you know, you show a result and you're like, oh, great, we can predict this, uh, and it feels good. But getting that all, you know into production and then not having the cost of maintaining it, uh, you know, be extremely high is a, is a real is a real challenge. Um, so now we're all trying to solve. You know, the question of what's the solution there. You know, then then that's a whole whole, whole other can of worms. So how much of that is is simply because a lot of this stuff is relatively new in in the scale of things. Like when you first learn to drive, like everything you need to use every single piece of your attention. But whatever put a few hours into it. How much of it is the newness factor? I think some of it's, well, I, I would say there, I mean, there's two parts of being something being new. I mean, there's, there's the element that like, okay, you need to learn it. Uh, and so that's, you know, the first time you learn, you know, anything, a new technology, you know, you're building a web app and you're learning React. Okay. It seems hard. Right. Uh, but, you know, ideally you reach a point where you, once you learn it and you think this is easy, right. Uh, once you sort of know the, know the tools, right. Um, I think most people that I talk to in the ML market, you know, once they learn it, they say, wow, this is hard. Right. And, and, and you never I, reach I, that point. They never reach that point. I mean, they, they, they don't reach a point of, oh, I love what I'm doing. I think, you know, you would, you know, if you make a, you know, uh, comparisons to like the re, you know, different technologies, I mean, I, like I, the, the web technology with react, most people who learn react, it takes a while, but then they, once they have the mental model for it, they say, oh, this is great. I totally get it. I can, I'm super productive. It's out of my way. Um, and, you know, assuming they don't want to go to no, a no code tool. Right. But, uh, I think in the ML sphere, when you're thinking about, I think they might, you might have that experience with something like an individual component, like, Oh, PyTorch, Oh, I love it. Right. Or Jax, I love it. Or, you know, weights and biases or some, some experiment tracker. I love, I love that. Right. Or some notebook tool hex. I love, I love that. Right. Um, but I have not really met anybody who look, you know, looks at the end to end pipeline and says, wow, I love our end to end pipeline. You know, this, this, this is great. Even once they know all the tools. Um, I guess what I was kind of getting at is there is just some inherent complexity, like some of these problems that we're trying to solve yeah. or people are trying to solve are just difficult and they need lots of pieces. And I wonder whether there's a risk at abstracting 
away too much that you either stop people, you take away the ability to, for people to to have that complexity in the mix or to, to be able to solve like these complex problems. Yeah, or that, that kind of thing. Do, do you see that as a risk? No, I definitely see that as a risk. Um, you know, I think there are two approaches to that. One is to try to make sure that your complexity or your abstractions, you know, are layered so that you can drop down to the next layer if necessary. Um, so I think that is, that's one approach. Um, I do think though, uh, you know, I hear this uh, objection a lot and, you know, I think aspirationally you need to sort of think what is the end game and what does that look like? You know, like for instance, I think if you look at what OpenAI is doing with their API or this, this general approaches, for instance, with sort of zero shot uh, learning or few shot learning, where essentially, you know, there is no even pipeline. And in fact, there's no data, right? All of a sudden you can solve problems literally in seconds, right? You can go in and say classic, you know, you can instruct the, the API, just write a human sentence, say classify this piece of test as a positive, you know, describe what you want. And then honestly, the API will give you a response, a classifier, essentially, you know, for let's say you're doing a text classification problem that is quite good, um, may in fact solve your, your problem. Or if you want to do, you know, entity extraction, you can just say, you know, give, you know who, who is who is this uh, document referring to? And, you know, here's, you know, and, and it will then say, it will just answer it for you. And, and so that's an, ex you know, that's pushing it all away. So there's no pipeline, there's no code, there's no, in fact, even data. Um, and I think it points to a world uh, where ML can be dramatically, dramatically simpler, you know? Um, so I just look at that. I, I, I use that as an example, just to say, uh, there's a tipping point with things like this, where, you know, you often, you know, if, if the technology is not good enough, you do want the escape hatch, but once it becomes good enough, you know, you kind of never want the escape hatch again, you know, tech, you know, think about speech to text APIs. Nobody, nobody says, oh, you know, I really want to like bring my own fine tuned data to do, you know, speech or, or it's, I don't want to do like in Python pipelines, right? You don't want to do your speech to text you know, stuff in Python pipelines, you kind of want like an API, and, you know, first of all, you want it to give good results with no data. And okay, maybe if you're really sophisticated, you want to be able to bring your domain data to it so that you can like, you know, fix the errors with respect to medical transcriptions or something like that. What you want, I mean, that, that the experience that you want is very, very high, even though behind the scenes, you know, as ML engineers, we know that there's all these, all these Python pipelines and containers all running around with you using GPUs to make it all happen. Uh, but I mean, you, it, it's gotten to the point uh, they've solved it to the point where you don't have to worry about that. And, um, you know, I actually find that more, you know, I, I spent a lot, a lot of time on these ML pipelines and thinking about the workflow. I think they will always be there. We should always, we should make them better, but you know, there's another set of world where we're saying, how do we actually kind of eliminate this, right? Eliminate the you need to think about it, right. For, to the end user. Uh, so I think they're both, I mean, I think, you know, bottom line is I think there, you know, there's going to be evolution in both, right. We need to make the pipeline approach, uh, where you have full control, much, much better. And I think we need also people that are really going after, you know, trying to 10x uh, the ability to leverage AI and ML. And I think that does require, I don't, I think you'll only 2x the experience with respect to pipelines. I think you need to think about how to go beyond pipelines if you really want to 10x the experience. But I think both are le legitimate approaches. Yeah, I mean, I can def definitely see, yeah, see some risks there, particularly since there is this, going to be this kind of early in-between stage where perhaps you have a lot of people who maybe don't come from a background where they understand what's going on underneath, who then maybe make assumptions about this thing that they're interacting with, that either it's infallible or perfect somehow, or all, all of these problems that, that, that I'm sure you, you and I have heard, heard many times. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, I think actually in some ways the most fundamental challenge uh, with ML that I've realized over time is the fact that it's non-deterministic. Um, and so I think with, with programming and a lot of software, you sort of know if you follow these steps, this will happen. Um, and I think with ML, you don't always know that. Um, and so, uh, you know, it becomes a little bit of a, you know, it can become a whack-a-mole problem. Uh, and, and, and that introduces a lot of challenge. You know, uh, if you have less sophisticated people come in and they're not aware of it, or maybe they solve their problem and then it doesn't get solved and it gets worse. Uh, and so, you know, that, that is definitely a challenge. Um, I do think there are these tipping points, though, where some things just get solved and, hey, it works. You know, we can do now forecasting. It works really well. Or we can do text classification. It works really well. We can do image recognition. It works really well. And I think once that tipping point happens, 
uh, it just unlocks a tremendous amount of uh, you know value for everyone. So you and your colleagues have got written about a, whole, a bunch of kind of really thoughtful posts on the continual blog, which I'll, I'll definitely link in the show notes. And you talk quite often, or at least one of them is you, where you talk about the modern data stack. I'd like to hear you explain a little bit about what that is. Why do we need a modern data stack? What's wrong with the old data stack? Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know it's uh, the modern data stack is a little bit earlier in the, uh, I think from the MLS perspective, it hasn't uh, penetrated as fully. That's this, these, these ideas around what it is to be the modern data stack. So um, the trend that I, you know, I saw, you know, and I think we're seeing in the in data infrastructure at companies is the overwhelming uh, sort of penetration and dominance and rise of the cloud data warehouse, right? Um, and that could be, a, you know, companies like Snowflake, it could be uh, Databricks's Lake House, it could be Redshift, BigQuery, um, you know, you're, you're essentially your cloud uh, at scale uh, data stores with SQL being dominant language uh, for modeling that data and for querying that data. This is where data is flowing. So data within a large companies is flowing there. It, it allows you to put some structure on it. You can still handle unstructured data. It allows you to enforce security, govern it. Uh, it allows you now with uh, sort of like the separation of storage and compute, it allows you to do massive scale in terms of your data. It allows you to do multiple workloads that don't step on each other. Uh, and it gives you the, 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 the lever using SQL as an interface language is just a dramatically simpler way to both transform and model and access uh, all of your, you know, all of your data. And so I think, and, and we, you know, I, this is, you know, coming from a previous world. In my background, you know, doing looking at in the Hadoop ecosystem, where you know everything's you know various files sitting around in object stores, and you have different query engines that are reading those files, or you know sometimes you're reading them directly, uh, which you know can give you some degree of flexibility. Uh, but increasingly, I mean, even with the Hadoop ecosystem, you know, SQL was was becoming by far the dominant you know access mechanism uh, into all of that underlying storage. Uh, and now with these rise of these sort of best of breed cloud data, data platforms, I think it's just, um, uh, it's become obvious that that's where the vast majority of enterprise data or just data will be stored and accessed. So that, that's the, you know, step, you know, chapter one, I think we're well on the way for that to be, for, for that actually to be in the reality. The modern data stack is just the concept that once you have that, you know, what's your ecosystem of tools that work around that in a, in a seamless way. And so, you know, you have tools like, you know, Fivetran, which is data ingestion. So you pay, well, hey, I want to bring all my data in from my, you know, my databases and from my SaaS applications and bring it into this data lake. And so because uh, tools like Fivetran know, hey, here's the sources and here's the sinks, they can just, you know, totally automate that. You, you know, literally can get all, connect all these things in, in, in minutes. Uh, you have new types of way to do data transformation. So you move from a world where, you know, you're doing it maybe all in Python and Spark and well, the Hadoop MapReduce type ecosystem. You're doing it to you know, SQL obviously becomes the language and then tools like VBT, the data build tool, uh, they become the dominant way that you model and, and, and model that data and clean that data within your uh, infrastructure. And then of course, there's a, the whole, you know, there's the first your BI tools and there's a whole ecosystem of tools now monitoring and quality, which is, hey, are these tables fresh? Are they being, re you know, are they being you know, updated when you think they're being updated? Uh, are there anomalies? Is there drift? Are there profiling? And it gives you a central kind of to this point around you know common inputs and outputs are just a centralized integration point. It really becomes this uh, sort of best of breed integration point where everybody can integrate. Um, you know, at Continual, you know, we think that uh, there needs to be an, it's a natural place. We want to simplify production ML uh, by building on this matter, modern data stack, namely saying, hey, data is flowing into your data warehouse. That's where you're going to get your uh, all your data to train and, and build your models, uh, that just simplifies things tremendously. And, uh, you know, it's also the place where often you want the predictions to land, right? So for some use cases, you want real-time predictions, but for many, many use cases, you actually want to write those predictions back into an environment where you then can query them. So what are the customers most likely to churn? What are your inventory levels over the next seven days? Uh, and so what we're trying to do at Continual is trying to think, reimagine production or operational ML for the modern data stack or for this era where data lives in the cloud data warehouse. And we, what we found is it allows us to build this vision for data first operational ML, ML operational ML that's centered on the data. And where's that data? Well, it's in your data warehouse. And so, you know, that gives us the, the way we kind of slot into folks architecture um, and, and sort of radi radically simplifying uh, the whole, the whole experience. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a, uh... 
a super interesting world. Like I, one of the things, maybe this says more about me than anything else, but like I, um, 99% of the names on those charts of like the tools and the data tools that people are using and the storage platforms and whatever, like completely uh, meant nothing to me. And I guess like <laughs> enterprise is, is just a different universe. Like, yeah. Well, no, that, that's a, it's a, that's a fact. I mean, it is true. That's a fascinating, I think that is a very true observation. And uh, I think doesn't, I think you're, you're, you're not behind the curve in the AI and ML world. So I think right now we're in this world these parallel universes where essentially data and analytics infrastructure, right? Sort of enterprise data and analytics infrastructure uh, is in, is moving and has is well on the way into this modern data stack where, you know, it's, sent, it's all centered on this data warehouse. And then there's a set of tools that are around that. That is typically owned by a data team, uh, not really an ML team, right? So a, da a da broadly defined data team going from business analyst uh, to analytics engineer, to data engineer, to data scientist. I would, I would put a data scientist in there, but probably not an ML engineer, right? So, and, and uh, then there's this parallel universe, which is the ML engineering and AI engineering ecosystem. And right, it's very, very disconnected from, from this, uh, the data warehouse up until this point. Um, and, you know, my, my view is that these ultimately will need to converge or will benefit a lot uh, to converge particularly for sort of mainstream operational, you know, you know, use cases within the enterprise. Uh, you know, if you're building autonomous driving cars, right, uh, fine, you know, you're going to be uh, stuck in, you know, engineering world for, for a long time. Um, uh, although, I, you know, even there, I do think, you know, look, you could benefit a lot from, you know, putting all of your performance data inside a, a, a queryable environment and using SQL and modeling it. You could simplify your life a lot. So I do think uh, now you're not going to be using Fivetran or whatever these ingestion tools are, right? To, to ingest from your Salesforce instance into your into that environment, you're going to be dealing with you know completely separate uh, uh, data. So there and there may be uh, you know data platforms that are more tailored towards the type of data that you're uh, that you're dealing with. Um, but I think for mainstream uh, predictive analytics ML type applications um, within you know think about your telecom company, your airline company, your retailer, you know, fast food chain, right? Uh, yep. Manufacturer, oil and gas company. I think most of those, there will be a move towards unifying these stacks. And does unifying those stacks imply, um, I don't know. I, I'm just thinking of the people who are behind these stacks. I mean, you were talking about this kind of universe of analysts and business analysts and so on, who I guess from what you were saying earlier, they are kind of lingua franca is more in the SQL world than anything else. And like, I'm just wondering what does that mean in terms of people's skills and how that change once you reach that point of convergence? The way I think about the persona question, which I think is a good one is, there's one group of people, you know, analysts, which really want to live in sort of pure no code experiences, you know, even SQL is too much. Um, right. And they don't really, they, you know, they don't think about uh, software, you know, best practices and, and, and whatnot. I think there's a another group of people, which I would call like the modern data team within a company. And uh, I would say those people's language of choice is SQL and a little bit of Python, right? But Python in the sense of like, hey, I can get stuff done in Python and do things analysis where necessary, where SQL doesn't work. But I'm not really going and you know being a software engineer at the. I'm adopting some software engineering practices, like I believe in. Oh, Git is nice, and you know having having a workflow with a team and doing a little bit of version control is is nice, and maybe even you know hooking up to like some sort of CI CD flow. This is really the power of a tool like DBT, which is sort of bringing software engineering and analytics, software engineering best practices to analytics and data engineers that are using SQL. Um, they do that is the future of uh, of you know production data work you know, in a company that thinks data is a serious business. Um, but that's a data team. There is a, there's a third group of, and I think that does include data scientists that are just trying to solve business problems, right? Where, you know, there could be some Python in there for sure. Um, uh, there's a third group, which is, you know, the hardcore ML engineers who are doing things like, you know, you know, ad serving and, you know, search re-ranking problems and, you know, building autonomous drive drivers and robots and, you know, those types of folks. Uh, and that's a parallel universe, right? I think that will stay in right. a parallel universe for the foreseeable future. I think right now, uh, a lot of you know mainstream, what I would call mainstream enterprise AI use cases, uh, sometimes get pulled into the ML engineering team, and I actually don't think that's where they should be solved. I think the ML engineering team really should be focused on kind of core, 
uh, product development type initiatives. Um, but the data team broadly, including data scientists, uh, should be focused on like, you know, embedding AI and ML across like the business functions. Think sales, marketing that, operations, et cetera. And that, I guess, is in part because a lot of the things that these these people are doing are, I don't know, common enough tasks or common enough workflows that there's a kind of a relatively standard pattern to them. So it, it fits into that. Uh, yes, and I think it's also just I look at those. Uh, so basically, ninety-five percent of the use cases that people come to me with, um, you know, the data is living already in the data warehouse. And where do they want the predictions? They kind of want them back in the data warehouse. Maybe they yep. want a little bit of an API for a couple of the use cases because they you know have a support you know, cl you know ticket classification problem that they're trying to do, and they want to route the ticket or automate some process. So there might be some real time in there. Um, but you know, they're not. Uh, you know, I think I think that's a very different world than saying I am serving. You know, like you know, in Facebook's case, right? They're serving. You know, there's. I think they read something like they're doing literally like several billion predictions per second, right? In in uh to to you know classify and rank like you know what what comments to show for every individual person, what the newsfeed ranking is, and all that sort of stuff. So you know, that's just a whole different ball game, right? And those those are uh, I think different stacks, right? If you're in that you know, your massive at scale product uh, ML, I mean, ultimately it's really gonna be owned by software engineering. And then an ML engineer is really part of a software engineering team. I think that's the, you know, you know, honestly, if you, if you isolate the ML engineering team too much, I actually don't think that's a great recipe for success. I think ML engineering is really part of software engineering. Um, and you need to think of it like software engineering, all of the pre best practices around software engineering, all the infrastructure uh, should be very similar. I think sometimes when it diverges too much, uh, it doesn't make sense. You know, I often look at, you know, model serving. It's, you know, at least uh, it, there's many elements where I would say, the con you know, ML engineering and software engineering should be uh, very, very tightly connected. Um, but that they don't, that can be really serves a product function. It doesn't necessarily need to serve the, all the other use cases that a business, a business has. That's maybe not a software business. But maybe not so much disconnected that you then lose the kind of the, data side of things or you lose touch with that yeah so, so yeah so that's a very interesting question which is right do you share how do you how does the data layer what does the data layer look like and i do think that the data layer will increasingly move towards these data warehouses for everybody i mean i think i think you're already seeing that where most uh you know data teams within an enterprise you have a clickstream i mean it's 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 in between i would say that it's, it's we're in a transition moment there but uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of very, very, very sophisticated um, you know, data engineers and ML engineers who realize, wow, my life, if I can handle my data needs within my data warehouse, at scale data warehouse environment, right? Uh, you know, and it, it, then I would, I'd like to do that. And I think even if you look at you know, a platform like Databricks, which obviously has Spark, from the, the heritage of Spark, you know, there's huge, massive attention towards uh, you know, two projects. One is the Spark SQL world, which is bringing SQL to, uh, you know, Spark. Uh, and the other one is around their sort of data lake or lake house kind of architecture, which means, hey, we're starting with structured tables and schemas, right? We're not, you know, reading parquet files, we're reading tables. Yes, of course, there's parquet files behind the scenes, or even, you know, delta tables behind the scenes. Um, but it's putting much more structure. It's saying SQL is the dominant language. You know, you know, they're trying to unify even SQL and Python, where you can kind of inter interchange between them. Uh, but in the core, the execution engine has this, uh, you know, it's, it's built around structured tables, which can include unstructured information. And it's queried using a query planner and an executor because there's so many benefits to doing that from a performance perspective, from a reliability, from a simplification perspective. Um, and so I think that that will, the data layer will converge to, um, to being in one of these hyperscale um, modern cloud data warehouses or lake houses, whatever you branding you want to, you know, or data clouds, you know, everybody's branding these things differently. Um, and they're all converging in terms of their functionality, like, you know, uh, Snowflake's adding Python support and uh, Databricks is adding more SQL support. And, you know, you can have external files being accessed and internally managed files. And so, you know, this general idea, I think the general point is the data will be structured, SQL will be the language of data modeling, SQL will be the language of access. So obviously we've been talking about it mostly from a kind of a technology standpoint so far. 
I'm curious whether you think that there are non-technological uh, barriers, human things going on, whether it's how teams are constituted, whether it's how people go about understanding the new kinds of problems that we can deal with now, or whether it's like how we go about coming up with propagating kind of best practices in this field. Yeah, the non-tech things that have to do with how successful you are at deploying your models. Absolutely. The, I mean, I think the number one problem that I see is just closing the loop to return on your investment and, and business impact. Um, and uh, there are some domains where that is very clear, like, for instance, fraud, where, uh, you know, if you reduce fraud, you just see the bottom line impact immediately if you're a financial institution. Uh, there are some use cases, for instance, like you know, abuse prevention within online platforms, you know, harassing abuse, you know, content that you don't want where you know you fundamentally your product experience is going to be it requires ml you know abuse is one but of course personalization is another right mm -hmm. um uh you know ad serving of course the personalization of ads so the whole personalization domain uh i think within uh, you know many companies that we talk to really have a vision for uh infusing ml you know across essentially every business function um I think in some of those cases, you know, you really need to think, well, how, what are you going to do with the predictions that you're making, right? So we have, for instance, a lot of customers uh, uh, in our, on our platform uh, building uh, predictions around customers, right? What are, are the customers going to churn? Are they going to expand? Uh, are they going to, you know, buy particular products? Um, you do need to then, th that is absolutely, that is enriching the data that you have with deeper insights about your company, you know, customers. So that's absolutely, we think every company has to have that. It just, it, those are the kind of things that you need to be in your data warehouse. You need these quantities to be in your data warehouse. And some of them are predictive. Some of them are aggregates of the past behavior and some of them are predictive of the future. And so you need to use ML to do that. But to really get to re re the return, you also need to make sure that you can pull that into some sort of action, right? Action by your sales team, by your marketing team, by your product team. Um, or something like that. So I think uh, you know, you know, staying focused on the solving the business problem, uh, uh, front, you know, you need to think what are you what are you trying to what are you trying to solve at the uh, truly to the end. The, the, the solution is not the prediction. The solution is the way you're changing a business process or changing a product experience or a customer experience. You know, that's the impact, and so you need to bring it all the way to that. I think that's and getting to that end milestone. I think is is, is one of the biggest challenges I see for many for the broad expansion of ML uh, across a business. And that, if you really do think of it in that, that fully end uh, way, like that's a far bigger conversation than I think is the conversation that's happening in the ML ops space at the moment. Yeah, I think the ML ops space is very much, uh, you can even hear it in our own conversation. I mean, there's so many, oh, uh, there's so many open questions around architecture and technologies and best practices and, uh, uh, that you know we're we're all as engineers trying to you know fix that and make our experiences better and of course that is you know an important work um uh but i think ultimately you know you really do need to get all the way to the to the business outcome right mm -hmm. um you know I, you know i think and i think um I think that I think that does take work, and I think it, I think it could use more attention, right? I think, for instance, I think automation there's huge, huge potential around automation. If you just look at the cost of la the labor force in in general, uh, and the labor cost in general, and 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 ultimately increasing productivity. As I'm an economist actually by training, and it's you know foundationally like you know human uh, success or or uh, you know the wealth of humankind is really, well, how productive are we? How much can we build and make as on a per person basis? And that, so automation is not replacing us. It's, it's actually making all of us more productive, uh, how much we can all produce and, uh, you know, that goods and services that we all like. And so I think, you know, can ML, how do you make ML get all the way to that, to allow us to produce more, produce better things, higher quality things, things we all enjoy. Um, and that, that's a that's a much bigger sto uh, story and uh, project for sure. So you have a PhD in public policy, and you come from, I guess, an academic background uh, originally, or you have that somehow at least in in your background. So I also recently transitioned over from history, actually, and I'm always interested in talking to people who've crossed the transom in that way, and just hearing, yeah, any observations you might have, either looking backwards at academia or looking forwards with the glasses of. of kind of research and academia into where you are now anything which stands out from that well there's so many different ways to take that question um 
you know, I, 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 one, one thing I would say is, I, you know, even looking back at academia, I actually think that academic institutions or universities around the world are literally one of the most amazing uh, artifacts of human civilization. So I, you know, I'm not a person who, you know, left academia because, you know, I was jaded with what universities were, you know, offering. There's, there's plenty of critiques of, you know, the ac you know, academic process and promotions and tenure and all of that. But I think just this, this idea that we all collectively get together and, and you know, try to discover new things about the world, um, you know, uh, not just in the commercial context, but also just uh, uh, in a more academic and scientific way, we educate a younger population. I'm a huge fan. And I think, you know, honestly, I actually see a lot of similarities between the academic world and the entrepreneurial and startup world. I think both in both areas, you're essentially trying to push the boundary for what's possible, discover, you know, what might be out there. Uh, you know, one, you know, it's just to disseminate the knowledge and, um, uh, and the other, it's to, you know, build, actually take it to the market and build something that, that you know, enters the world. And I think there, those are two different vehicles. In the academic world, the vehicle is you can publish a paper. And essentially, that's really the only vehicle that you can take an idea and make it, you know, spread it. Um, but I think in, in the entrepreneurial world, it's essentially the same thing. It's a take an idea, discover an idea, explore, you know, do tests and experiments, see if they work, see if it resonates. Uh, but then, you know, rather than a paper, you're, you're building a product or a service. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, you know, I kind of view the both, you know, they're sort of actually in some ways they're, they're, although they're very different worlds, they're very, they're very similar. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's one observation I have, you know, my own personal journey, you know, uh, you know, I've always, you know, gone back and forth between, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the academic world and, and the entrepreneurial kind of world, just because, uh, I you know I like thinking about what's possible and what the future is and it's a long yeah it's a long story but but uh, one that I think just gets to the fact that I actually don't view them as so different is the research data stack the the modern data stack uh, what are the differences there no absolutely so that that's a great question I mean that actually the first startup that I did sense was very much born out of you know hey here's what we're all learning in graduate school all of these tools right the R and Python type tools they're all built for you know, essentially you're, you know, okay, you're, what are you trying to do? What's the job to be done? You're trying to create a, do some analysis and create a plot to put in a paper, right? And so there's very little attention to uh, sort of either collaboration, right? You're not, you know, you're not working typically, I mean, although you're working with a group of co-authors, often it's on a, you know, very small scale, uh, kind of on a one-off basis where it doesn't make sense to build too much process around it, right? So, you know, software engineers are always complaining about the, pro the, uh, the, 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 the coding styles of academics, of course. Um, but it does just get the job done, which is to do the analysis and, uh, you know, publish the paper and then move on to the next bit of analysis. So I think there is a there is a big difference between the stacks uh, for 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 the academic world um, and the the you know the in production ML. Um, in production ML really doesn't exist honestly in the academic world uh, much, uh, if at all. Maybe in maybe certain domains in a bio lab or something where it's you know there's not really long long project to accomplish something it might be more important in so bioinformatics but you know certainly in economics public policy you know social sciences um, it, it's all uh, you know just kind of one off so the core languages are the same you know R and Python are the dominant languages but uh, the rest uh, the rest is quite different and I think that was the big gap that you know I saw uh, in the 2014 era. Um, sort of saying, hey, the tools that people are coming out of grad school and they're going into, you know, startups and enterprises, they don't want to use SAS and SPSS and these traditional enterprise tools. They mm -hmm. want to use Python. They want to use R. You know, how do you enable that? And then uh, allow them to collaborate, use the cloud resources, get to production. And I think that journey obviously goes on, right? The, the ZenMLs of the world are, are examples of, you know, how do you uh, allow people to easily uh, go that next mile, but that next mile, it really is something that's relevant for people building products and services, not really people in the academic world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just as, a, as an aside, like I, t I took a few minutes also to, to very briefly scan the parts of your PhD dissertation that I could understand, which for listeners is on uh, kind of causal inference in public policy. And, you know, you hear people talking about causal inference a lot more uh, these days in the kind of AI ML world of things. Yeah, I don't know if that's that's something which has been, I don't have the context to know whether that was something which is a far longer time coming, but yeah, I found that interesting. No, I mean, I, I do, uh, 
I do find, so my, my PhD dissertation was on, uh, you know, causal inference for public policy. And most of it, most of it was on using Bayesian methods or sort of Bayesian methods to evaluate the causal impact of, uh, of policies, dynamic policies that are evolving over time. And, uh, and so I was, a, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a Bayesian statistician at heart, very, very strongly mm -hmm. Bayesian, uh, you know, uh, you know, having done, uh, well, having looked, been a frequentist at heart, this is now getting deep into statistics, but uh, these, there's kind of two camps of statistics here. Um, so I actually think both of these ideas, you know, uh, Bayesian inference, this idea that, you know, fundamentally what you're trying to, you know, what, you know, what, what can you predict given what you observe, you know, fundamentally, that's what most businesses want to know, right? What do you, given what and you observe. And update it as you're you, going along. And update it as you're going along, right? Uh, but it's basically given what you observe about the world, what are the features that you observe? What are the signals that you observe? What do you believe about whatever you're trying to do, your customer or whatever it is, this image or whatever it is. And as soon as you frame the problem like that, you are doing what's called Bayesian inference. You are conditioning on the data and you are making an inference uh, about, about uh, into the future. That's very different than traditional statistics, which is really all about repeated sampling. Uh, so it's saying, you know, if you were to collect another data set, you know, what would the, what would your, you know, your, your prediction be? And what is the distribution of that prediction if you had more and more data sets, which is a very uh, contrived kind of mental model. Um, and so, uh, and then in, in the machine learning world, they kind of just say, oh, you know, screw it, let's just optimize something uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and get to a point estimate typically. Um, and so, I, you know, I would love it. There is some work on doing, you know, prob around probabilistic programming, which is sort of the marrying of Bayesian statistics and, and programming. Uh, I, I think there's tremendous potential there. It's really still in the research domain. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, I would love it if there was a, a, a commercial opportunity, but it's, uh, you know, it's 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 very much the research domain, but it is a it would be a great way to think about machine learning problems. Likewise, I think causal inference, uh, um, you know, is uh, you know is something that should be that should be much much more in, at the fore of many use cases. I think experimentation is a huge huge unlock uh, for data driven companies. So just doing experimentation, not just uh, machine learning, but having a uh, experimentation platform and the ability to rapidly, rapidly do experiments. I think it, you know, it leads to how to do production ML well is the ability to do experimentation so that you can, uh, you know, you can roll out models and see the performance on real world. What happens in the real world when you do that, which is often not actually what happens in your test set, right? So mm -hmm. you often hold out data, you know, and you think, okay, I've got my, you know, unbiased estimate. Uh, of of my performance and it looks good and so you feel confident but the reality is that's just right. you know, there's so many ways for that to go wrong and you know experimentation is really one of the only ways to really see what is the causal impact of you know rolling this out on you know user activity or fraud or or or, or whatnot and so experimentation is, is and causal inference experimentation ultimately is a way to credibly estimate causal effects uh you know is something that's very important so i think you know both uh well, certainly experimentation and causal inference, I think, is, has a big future over the next few years. Uh, you know, Bayesian inference may have a breakout moment like, you know, deep learning at some point. If you can kind of marry more uh, probabilistic approaches to deep learning, I think that does have benefits in a lot of cases. I think you're seeing that now, you know, with some of these planning applications, you know, reinforcement learning, where you really need to understand the distribution in your predictions to be able to plan appropriately. Um, whereas if you just have the sort of maximum or just like a point estimate of the, your most best guess for the future. That's not quite enough to do planning. You need to actually understand mm -hmm. the uncertainty around the future. Uh, and, and so you need, to, you need to incorporate that. But um, I think it's exciting. It's exciting. Uh, it's, it's very, very hard to do. So, you know, I, I don't think it's going to imminently disrupt any, uh, everything. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we usually end our podcast with a couple of questions, just quick answers or yeah, in whatever direction you'd like to, to take them. So firstly, what would be a, a quick win that you think someone can add to make their productionizing the models more robust? Well, to my last question, I mean, I do think for serious, uh, doing serious production work, you know, at scale, like for instance, in your product, connecting it to an experimentation infrastructure uh, that allows you to get sort of true out of sample ground truth data feedback loop into your model to evaluate performance is really, really critical. Um, that's really the only thing that's going to tell you, you know, whether things are going wrong. Uh, I worked, for instance, at a, I was doing a credit, I worked at a company that was doing credit modeling. Um, you know, we, it was very easy for us to convince ourselves uh, that we had built, you know, credit risk models that were, 
you know, performing well. And we were data scientists who did, you know, tried to be really careful about data leakage and, you know, not looking at our test set. Uh, but, you know, as you iterate multiple times, you know, and you, you know, might be reusing some of those test sets occasionally, uh, it's just really, really hard uh, to not peak. And the world is also fundamentally changing. Your, your, your users are, can be adversarial. They can react to your to, to to how these models are and change their behavior, and so I think connecting it, you know, if you really want robust models, if you can, you know, connect it to ground truth data and monitor that ground truth data and the performance of your models on true out of sample ground truth data that's coming after you've, you know, deployed the model. I think that's that's one. Now that's not so simple. Um, so a simple one might just be you know truncate your data. Uh, so like don't, uh, you know. <laughs> Be careful about outliers. You know things can go crazy with outliers. So uh, you know may, maybe just uh, you know it, it's a, it's a kind of quick hack that you know just make sure your data is kind of in the range um, uh, of what you of what you anticipate because you know one or two depending on the methods you use uh, you know even one or two points that are far outside can kind of get totally crazy results um, and so you know sometimes truncation uh you know of uh, things can just be helpful in terms of making things a little bit more robust to that sort of data quality issues that typically it's a data quality issue that creeps in upstream uh mm -hmm. it's sometimes nice just not to make it completely destroy your 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 methods either your training or your inference mm -hmm. and from a tool making perspective what would you say or, or yeah what would be your gut feeling of something that's being neglected in this kind of productionizing of models at space from something which people haven't aren't making or aren't making in the right way or are missing out somehow well i'm obviously a little bit biased here but i mean i do fundamentally believe that you know people should be paying more attention to data first approaches and data first workflows um what that means is not always perfectly defined but you know, I think just generally people should be spending more time. How do I just focus on this, on the data? And can I really build an end-to-end -end workflow that from a user perspective is really centered on the data? Um, and ideally gets them all the way to production. So whichever app, if you're doing a classification, you know, use case, or you're doing an information extraction use case, or you're doing an image classification, you know, whatever it is, or personalization, you know, you know, try to, I think it's more people should be spending the idea of, could I build an experience where all the pipelines and the code and everything kind of falls, behind, you know, behind the scenes and the user just sits there and says, you know, Hey, let me, you know, what's the data? What am I trying to predict? Let me show some examples. Ideally one example, uh, right. But, uh, you know, if you have to have more examples, you know, that's great. I think it would be completely game changing. For instance, if, you know, any new use case you had, you could just sort of start with no data, get a baseline and then, and then improve it over time. Maybe you add a ton of data over time and you fine tune everything, but you can just quick, you know, kind of this, 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 this lesson, I think that a lot of people say of like, start with something simple. It would be amazing if you didn't even have to, you know, have any data and you could just start and you, you know, you you'd solve your classifier and you get everything end to end working. And then you, all you need to really do is think, okay, well, how do I get more training data and good training data and find the outliers uh, and bring that? Because in the end, I think that really is the only thing uh, that's unique. Um, all the other stuff, you know, feels like once we discover the best practices around it, we'll continue to evolve it over time. But, you know, the end uh, application builder uh, shouldn't have to pay as much attention to that. Uh, and so I wish that some of the ML ops tooling people who know those tools so well would, you know, think about that other consumer who maybe, you know, wants to focus on the business one and then, you know, what's remaining, what's the essential complexity? I think it's the data. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to come on for the conversation. I really enjoyed speaking uh, speaking with you and learning more prior to the prior to us talking, learning more about Continual and all of the work you're doing. It definitely sounds sounds fascinating. No, thank you, Alex, for having me on. That was deeper than many of my uh, podcasts, but I mean, hopefully, it was certainly enjoyable for me, and I look forward to seeing uh, where ZML goes. And and uh, I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you for listening to this latest episode of Pipeline Conversations. If you enjoyed what you heard, please consider giving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us get seen by more people. And of course, it's always nice to receive feedback. If you have suggestions for future guests, please send them over to podcast at zenml.io. Thanks. Until next time.